All right. Um, hi, folks. Um, welcome uh, to the Robotics Colloquium. Today, it's a great pleasure to have um, Ani Majumdar visit us. Um, Ani is an assistant professor at Princeton um, in mechanical and aerospace engineering. Um, he's won too many awards for me to list, but um, some of them are the Sloan Fellowship, the Young Investigator Program, recent best paper. And I think his work is super exciting because he does um, work that convinces me that the silly learning things that I do will have some guarantees. And so, um, yeah, it's really a pleasure to have him here, and I'm looking forward to the talk. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for the, the invitation, the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, back at, uh, at UW, and I'm excited to share, about some, share some of the things we've been uh, thinking about in my group. Uh, so as Abhishek mentioned, uh, in my group, we are trying to enable robots to operate with formal assurances. Uh, typically statistical guarantees on safety and on performance in complex environments. Uh, and these are some of the, the systems that we've been playing around with uh, recently. Uh, and over the past, I guess, five or six years or so, we've been specifically thinking about how we can make formal assurances uh, on robotic systems that are enabled by deep learning components. Uh, so I think as everyone in this audience knows, we've seen massive progress in perception, in uh, kind of human uh, prediction, human motion prediction, planning, uh, control, and of course, most recently, uh, natural language processing, natural language understanding, uh, incorporating foundation models, uh, kind of deep learning models more broadly uh, into our autonomy stack uh, in these different ways. Uh, so what we've been thinking about in my group is how can we make some formal assurances, like what can we guarantee uh, when we have uh, these kind of deep learning enabled uh, robots. Uh, and the focus of this talk specifically is going to be about uh, foundation models. Uh, so if you uh, kind of have some large pre-trained foundation model uh, for language or maybe a multimodal model uh, that you're incorporating into your robotic system, uh, can we make any kinds of reasonable uh, formal assurances in the form of statistical guarantees? OK, so I think that the fundamental challenge, is, uh, technical challenge as I see it, has to do with generalization. Uh, so we train our kind of machine learning systems on some large but still finite amount of data. Uh, we plug it into our robotic system, maybe in the, the perception kind of module. Uh, what can we say about generalization? So what can we say when we take this system, deploy it in a previously unseen environment? And I think we see this challenge of generalization playing out in many real world uh, kind of robotic systems that are deployed out in the wild. Uh, this is just one example. So an autonomous car is kind of driving down, um, or a semi-autonomous car is driving down uh, highway at evening time, uh, and what's interesting here is the output of the perception system. Uh, I guess as you can see, the perception system is perceiving a yellow traffic light, uh, when in fact there's no yellow traffic light, it's really just the sun uh, that's kind of low down in the sky. Uh, that's causing the car to try to brake here. Uh, in this case, the human driver happens to be paying attention. Uh, they override the braking command, they press the, the gas pedal, uh, but the, if this was fully autonomous, then this could have kind of been a, a pretty bad incident. Uh, I see this as a failure of generalization. This perception system uh, was trained on gigantic amounts of data, lots and lots of different scenarios, uh, but it's never encountered this particular scenario before, uh, and it's failing to, to generalize in this novel scenario. Uh, and we see this challenge of generalization playing out uh, not just for autonomous vehicles, but in many other robotic systems as well. Uh, if we're trying to deploy robots in homes, in offices, in kind of human-centered environments, uh, these systems must also be able to kind of flexibly generalize to scenarios that they were not explicitly trained to, to handle. Um, so yeah, I guess that's kind of the, the motivation for the, the talk. Uh, so currently, our robotic systems lack assurances on safety and on performance when we deploy them uh, in novel environments. Uh, and kind of digging down a little bit deeper, uh, one major challenge that I see uh, currently has to do with uncertainty quantification. Um, so it's not necessarily problematic that these systems fail in some situations. I don't think we should expect kind of 100% success across everything. Uh, but often our robotic systems don't know when they don't know. Like they don't have a kind of rigorous notion of uncertainty. Uh, and we as engineers often don't know what our robots don't know. Uh, so that's going to be the, the focus of the, the talk uh, today. Um, so I guess in my group we worked on a number of different uh, directions to do rigorous uncertainty quantification. Uh, we worked on some generalization bounds for policy learning, uh, pack based theory in particular, uh, that gives us quite a, kind of a quantitative understanding uh, of failure rates in novel environments. 
Uh, we've also done things like runtime monitoring, so failure prediction and out of distribution detection. Uh, so trying to figure out when our learned kind of machine learning components will uh, fail uh, when they're deployed in new environments uh, with some statistical guarantees on false positive and false negative rates uh, of uh, detection. Um, and recently, we've also done some work on rapid uh, adaptation uh, in out of distribution environments. Uh, so let's say you train uh, a policy for uh, some kind of dynamic manipulation task, uh, like scooping in simulation, uh, but then you try it out on some real world environments and it fails. Uh, how can you quickly adapt? Maybe just within a, a couple of trials, a couple of interactions with the physical environment, how can you get to, to success? Uh, and that, that's something we've been thinking about recently as well. Um, but I guess in the talk today, I'm gonna focus on the latest uh, in, in this kind of line of work. And I'm going to talk about uncertainty quantification for language-instructed robots uh, that are employing uh, foundation models, so uh, language models, or, or kind of more broadly, uh, multimodal models. Uh, and specifically, this is uh, work that was led by my PhD student, Alan Wren, uh, in collaboration with a, a number of uh, researchers at uh, Google DeepMind, uh, Andy Zhang, Darsa Sadig, uh, and, and many others. Uh, so yeah, I'll focus on, on this work uh, primarily in the talk uh, today. Um, so I think as most people in the, the audience are probably familiar, uh, there's been this kind of huge excitement around uh, incorporating large language models uh, into the robotics stack. Uh, so doing or using LLMs uh, for robot planning uh, in a way that uh, kind of leverages their ability to generate long horizon plans, uh, to leverage the prior knowledge uh, and, and the rich context uh, that these pre-trained kind of internet scale uh, models have. Uh, perform some level of abstract reasoning, uh, and also just be able to generate code uh, that can be directly executed on your robot as a policy. Uh, but I think, again, the main challenge that I see in, in this uh, area has to do with generalization and reliability. Uh, so what can we say when we deploy these language-instructed robots in a diverse set of environments uh, with a diverse set of instructions for a diverse set of goals? Uh, yeah, can we ensure their reliability um, when, when they're required to generalize to new uh, scenarios. And I think in the context of LLMs in particular, there are a couple of specific challenges. Uh, one is kind of the well-documented uh, tendency of LLMs to hallucinate, so to provide outputs that are incorrect, untethered from reality, uh, often to do this kind of quite confidently. Uh, where's the audio? Mm. Is that? Uh, oh, I see, I see, sorry about that. I thought it was coming from my uh, uh, screen, which confused me. A anyways, yeah, I guess the hallucination is, is one uh, major challenge. Uh, and um, yeah, and also the high degree of uh, ambiguity in natural language uh, instructions. Uh, so yeah, let me talk about these challenges in a, in a bit more uh, detail. Ben, Questions, yes, question. of course. There was a video there that was um, um, sort of slower than real time. Was, is, is that, because, like, is there a reason why? Uh, slower than real time. Yeah, the six x speed up. Like, uh, I'm trying to understand. Like, what is it about? Oh, the, this one specifically. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess this was the the Seikan work um, from from Google. Uh, I think there were. This is not what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, not not yet. Okay. Uh, but actually, I guess in the the videos, I'll show there's some speed up as well. Uh, there are a couple of reasons. Um, one is just the inference time for the, the language models. Uh, I mean, they've gotten faster, but I think it's, it still takes a bit of time. Okay. So every time uh, there's a plan that's generated, uh, there, there's some amount of inference time, typically on, on the order of like a second or a couple of seconds or so. Um, yeah, and I think with this work specifically, uh, I don't remember exactly, but I think they were using one of the RT, uh, uh, like robotics transformers uh, kind of uh, policies. Uh, those have some uh, latency and inference time as well, uh, so hence the, the slowdown. Yep. Yeah, good questions. Yeah, and I'm happy to kind of keep taking questions uh, as, they, as they come up. Um, so here's the example kind of illustrating some of the challenges that we see with, with LLMs. Um, so in this example, we're uh, kind of asking the robot to place the bowl in the microwave. Uh, but there happen to be two bowls, so there's a metal bowl and a plastic bowl. Uh, and if you asked, uh, so in this case, this is GPT 3.5. Uh, so you describe the scene. There's a metal bowl and a plastic bowl in the counter. Uh, suppose you're a robot, and the human asks you to place the bowl in the counter. Uh, sorry, place, place the bowl on the counter in the microwave. Uh, which bowl would you pick up? Uh, GPT 3.5 tells you I would pick up the metal bowl. 
uh, as it is more likely to withstand the heat from the microwave. Uh, but of course, as, as we know, uh, if you do this, if a robot actually executes this plan, you place a metal bowl in a microwave uh, that could potentially lead to a, a fire. Um, so yeah, I guess for me, this, this kind of example motivates the idea that our robots should know when they don't know. Like we shouldn't just blindly execute some plan that a large language model generates. Uh, so in this case, uh, maybe the robot should have some sense of uncertainty and should ask, uh, which bowl did you mean, the plastic one or the, the metal one? Yes? Um, I noticed that you described the scene in words. Yes. Um, and this, so are you dealing with perception at all, or did yeah. that change the equation? <laughs> yeah, good. So I'll say a little bit about the, the pipeline. Uh, one thing we were doing here is using a, a VLM, uh, so Vision Language Model, to take the, the kind of uh, sensory observations, turn that into a text, uh, and then we're going to use a large language model to do the planning. Uh, in principle, I guess you could do all of that with just one multimodal model, uh, but here we had this kind of modular approach. Yeah, yeah. but I'll get into the, the details of the architecture in a bit. Um, so yeah, I guess there are a couple of uh, kind of challenges with doing rigorous uncertainty quantification for, for large language models. Uh, one is overconfidence. Um, so here's a, a simple example. Um, so you give GPT 3.5 again uh, this prompt. So there are three drawers. Uh, which drawer has the Coke? Uh, top, middle, or bottom? Uh, it confidently says bottom, right? And, and there's no, I think, a priori reason for it to be bottom. There's no additional context, but it's, it's kind of 92.6% confident uh, that the Coke is in the, the bottom drawer. And we see this with, with many examples uh, as well. This is just, just one example. Uh, another important challenge has to do with uh, um, the length bias that, that we see if we use kind of classical ways of uh, doing uncertainty quantification um, for language. Uh, so maybe the, the kind of most popular way is to look at the perplexity of a sentence. So roughly the, uh, the entropy, if you look at the, the soft max scores of the tokens in a sentence. Uh, if you use that, however, um, yeah, you see some interesting phenomena. Here's an example. Uh, so there's a Sprite and a can of Coke on the counter. Uh, and the instruction is to put a drink uh, in the middle drawer. Uh, and if you just look at two sentences, so two samples from the model, and you assess the, uh, the perplexity, so the entropy of the log probabilities for the entire sentences, uh, you see that if you, yeah, if you look at, I will put the can of Coke in the middle drawer, uh, it's significantly less confident, so the log prob is significantly smaller. Uh, then something that seems semantically the same. So I will put the Coke in the middle drawer. Uh, it's much more confident that that is kind of a correct answer uh, to, this, uh, to this sentence. Yeah, and in general, we see kind of bias against really long sentences. If you look at the perplexity score, uh, that biases you against long sentences, uh, even though these two sentences kind of have semantically the same meaning, uh, given the, the prompt uh, that was uh, given to the, the model. OK, so I guess in, in this work, uh, what we're trying to do, um, we kind of formalize uh, into a notion that we call uncertainty alignment. Uh, and this has two components. So we want to quantify the uncertainty of our large language um, model-based planner uh, to do th two things. Uh, the first is uh, we want calibrated confidence. Uh, so we, as a user, want to be able to specify some target level of success, some target probability of success. Uh, and we want our LLM to ask for enough help uh, or clarifications from humans uh, in order to get to that level of success. Uh, but at the same time, we want to uh, have our robot uh, kind of act as independently as possible. Um, so we don't want the robot to constantly be interrupting the, the human. Uh, so we want to minimize the amount of help uh, that the robot seeks. Um, if it's helpful, you can think of this as a constrained optimization problem. Uh, so you want to ask for enough help to get to some level of success, but you want to minimize the help um, given that level of success. OK, so that's the, the broad kind of setup. Maybe let me pause for a second, see if there are any questions here. So usually when, we're, when we say LLM at this point, we're kind of referencing like GPT-4 or yeah. something that's trained on the broad internet. Yeah. So we're, in terms of distributional coverage of things, we're yeah. just thinking like, we haven't tried to constrain it at all to not yet. robotic specific. Not yet, but yeah, I'll, I'll describe how, how, how to do that, or, or that we should do that, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Is anything in the problem specific to LLMs, or just like any learned planner producing categorical Yeah, so I think this is, this is pretty broad. Uh, any any learned uh, 
like module that's kind of providing categorical or even just any outputs uh, that are not calibrated, right? Like where the confidences are not calibrated. Um, yeah, I guess some of the the recipe that I'll describe like could be more broadly applicable beyond language. So. Need to talk about this, but sure. like the the assumption is IID, like there's no. Yes, good. Yeah, so I'll actually yeah I'll describe it just in the the next slide. Uh, yeah, so the the approach that we've developed, so we call it no no, uh, short for no when you don't know, uh, and it's going to have two key ingredients. Uh, so the first is to pose the problem of planning with language. Uh, as a multiple choice question answering problem that will have some kind of nice benefits that I'll go get into. Uh, and the second is going to be to use conformal prediction, which is a kind of powerful technique for doing uncertainty quantification. Um, all right, so I'll get to Sid's question in, on this slide. Uh, so I'll kind of describe the setup a little bit more formally, introduce some notation. So we're going to assume that in every episode, uh, the robot is going to be placed in some environment that I'll call little e. Uh, so you can think of this environment as a partially observable Markov decision process uh, that's initialized to some particular kind of random state. Uh, for every episode, the robot is going to be provided some natural language instruction, uh, L, uh, corresponding to some goal, G. Um, and you can think, I guess just to make it concrete, you can think of the goal as some subset of acceptable states in your PomDP. Uh, and the goal is not kind of directly observed. The goal is only indirectly observed through the natural language uh, instruction. Uh, I'll define a, a tuple, which I'm going to call a scenario uh, of the environment, the language instruction, and the goal. Uh, and we're going to assume that there's some unknown, potentially complicated distribution over scenarios. Um, so di uh, yeah, so distribution over environments, language instructions, and, and goals. Uh, so we won't assume kind of explicit knowledge of the distribution. It could be really complicated. Uh, but we're going to assume some uh, IID uh, data for calibration, some IID scenarios that we're going to use for calibration. So that's where the IID assumption comes in. OK. Um, so next, I'll describe the kind of overall architecture of the, the human-robot uh, collaboration, the overall architecture of the policy. Uh, so initially, as I mentioned, the robot is placed in some environment. It's given some natural language instruction, like place the bowl in the microwave. Um, so here we use a, a VLM to take the robot's sensory observations, describe that in text. Uh, we also provide some additional context uh, about what's in the environment, like there's a microwave and a landfill and so on. Um, and then we then prompt the large language model to generate some possible plans, some possible next steps for the robot to execute, uh, given the instruction uh, and given the, the kind of environment description. Uh, so the concatenation of the instruction, the environment description, and the possible plans. Uh, I'm going to call that the context. Uh, and I'll refer to that as xt, so the context at time t, uh, which is the concatenation of kind of all of these things. Uh, we're then going to think about this as a multiple choice question answering problem uh, that has some number of labels, so a, b, c, d. And then we append another label e, which is just none of the options above. So we have five labels. Uh, and then we kind of ask the LLM again to score these different options, so, so to score the different tokens, A, B, C, D, E. Uh, so we're asking the, the LLM, like, which one of these plans is good. Uh, the LLM then kind of scores the different ones with its softmax scores. Uh, and this is where conformal prediction comes in. So I'll go into the, the details of it. Uh, but basically, what conformal prediction will do will specify a threshold of confidence. Uh, and we're going to construct this prediction set uh, which is a subset of the plans that were generated uh, that have a score that are higher uh, than this specified uh, threshold. So if this prediction set has size 1, so if it's a singleton, uh, then the robot is going to execute that plan. Uh, in this case, it's a non-singleton, so there are two options in the plan. Uh, that's going to trigger a call for help. So the robot is going to seek some clarification, either by just presenting these options to the human and saying, which one should I pick? Uh, or uh, by asking a language model to generate some freeform question uh, whose answer will then help it disambiguate uh, between the, the two options. Uh, so yeah, in this case, the question is which bowl, uh, plastic or, or metal? Uh, let's say the human clarifies, uh, pick up the, the plastic one. Uh, and then we're going to assume that there's some low-level uh, kind of language condition policy that's responsible for executing that plan. Um, so that's an important assumption. I'll, I'll kind of get back to it. But for now, we're just going to kind of make that assumption that uh, at the low level, there's some kind of module phi that converts this plan that was selected into actions. Uh, that 
steps the POMDP forward, you go through this whole process again, uh, and, and so on, until the episode results in, in success or, or in failure. OK, so that's kind of the, the high-level uh, overview of the, the architecture. So I'll next kind of dig into some of the details. Yeah, question. Just a, a quick question, because I didn't notice it in that particular architecture overview. Yes. Is there a feedback mechanism, like for example, well, for the robot to, or the, I should say these models, to find, figure out, hey, every time there's a microwave involved, we're never touching the metal bowl, for example? OK, so not, not yet. Um, that, that would be interesting to, to do some kind of like, online like, learning. Uh, yeah, I guess not, not so far. So in, in that uh, feedback loop, uh, it's not necessarily kind of learning uh, that, that picking up the, the metal bowl is, is bad. Yeah. Yes. Slide, yeah. Does the human always confirm the execution of every action? Um, so, OK, so I guess the, uh, if the robot asks for help, which happens when that prediction set is a non-singleton, uh, then the human selects so one. Executes it autonomously. Yes. Autonomously, yes. yes. And, and it could be right or wrong. It could be right or wrong, and we're going to bound the probability that it's wrong. Okay. Yes. Good. OK. Yes, I wish. Yeah. The, so it's a POMDP. Does, do these planners like do information gathering ever, or uh, are they like pretty whatever? Yeah, so they could do information gathering. Um, I guess you could tell the language model, uh, like, this is the information you have, this is the, the, the goal. In fact, uh, do you see that happening ever? Not for these tasks. Uh, but it's an interesting question. Um, because I, the reason I'm wondering is because like, when it makes a mistake, is it because of like, partial observability or because of generalization error? Yes. Uh, does it matter? <laughs> uh, I guess, I mean, it, it does matter. I think if it, if it is partial observability, then you'd like the robot to take actions that reduce uncertainty. Right. Uh, we, I think our tasks were not so complicated or kind of long horizon because the that that matters. Because wouldn't deal with partial observability. Correct, yeah. Only with generalization. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. So yeah, let me describe these kind of two technical uh, components that I mentioned. Um, so the first one is, is thinking about planning as a multiple choice question answering uh, problem. Uh, and yeah, the way kind of I described it previously, we take the instruction, we take the environment description, we take these plans, and then we ask the, the LLM to score them, like ask the LLM which option is correct. Um, and basically what yeah, this is doing is kind of reducing the problem of planning uh, to just next token prediction. We're just interested in kind of assessing our confidence uh, among the different five different tokens, A, B, C, D, E, corresponding to the different plans that the LLM originally generated. Uh, and this is nice for a couple of reasons. One is that this aligns quite nicely with the training data that these LLMs are often trained on, uh, which have multiple choice question answering data sets as kind of a major portion. Uh, they also align naturally with the loss functions that LLMs are trained on, which kind of naturally have to do with uh, next token prediction. Um, and so we can just kind of use the softmax scores uh, uh, to assess our confidence on the different plans. Uh, and this also eliminates the length bias that I mentioned before. Uh, so if, instead of looking at entire sentences, uh, we're just looking at the softmax score uh, for, the, for the particular tokens A, B, C, D, E. Uh, so we never have a length bias. It's always just just five five tokens uh, that we're kind of uh, um, looking at the confidence for. Well, uh, that is surprising. Uh, maybe I'm, the possible next steps like um, could they be non-unique? Um, like, w w w like, is there a possibility that like action step action you know A B C D and maybe there's a A prime which is Put the pretty plastic bowl and ah, okay. the, yes. put the ugly uh, green plastic yes, yes, bowl. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm just trying to, yeah. like, I, I don't know how it eliminates that. That's going to be a question. But. Oh, sorry. So the, the length bias gets eliminated. It, it eliminates length bias, yes. but it doesn't eliminate um, redundancy. That's correct, yeah. So there's some, uh, yeah, I guess there's some prompting that also goes into de generating semantically diverse plans, like you don't want to have like A, B, C, D, E that are kind of all the same thing, but right. just described in different ways. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's some amount of like prompting that, that also goes into so to, to getting that. that. They're all semantically unique. Uh, not necessarily. OK, so, uh, so they, there could be uh, multiple plans that are semantically the same. Uh, and the approach will kind of handle that. Like ultimately, what we want is just for some acceptable plan to be executed. Uh, so if you have like two options that are described in different ways, but actually they mean the same thing, you just care about kind of doing one of those, uh, and you're fine with with doing anything that that that's correct. I was just wondering if the softmax scores would be affected by that. Um, so the softmax scores, 
Yeah, might be affected by that. I guess if you described a plan in a, in a kind of weird way, like pretty bowl or something like that, then, then that might impact the softmax scores. So far, I guess the softmax scores are not calibrated. Uh, and that's actually where the, the next ingredient comes in. So what happens when our softmax scores are not necessarily meaningful or not calibrated? How do we, how do we deal with that? Uh, this is where conformal prediction comes in. Uh, so it's a pretty kind of nice and, and powerful way of doing uncertainty quantification uh, that's going to allow us to make some nice statistical guarantees on task completion. Um, it's not going to assume explicit knowledge of the distribution of scenarios. It's just going to assume knowledge of, or it's just going to assume access to some finite number of training environments from training scenarios. Uh, it's quite computationally lightweight and easy to implement, which makes it appealing. Uh, and in some way that I'll kind of describe in, in more detail, it improves with the growing uh, capabilities of your underlying foundation model. That's a point that I'll come back to later. Uh, and over the past couple of years, we've seen a number of kind of groups trying to use conformal prediction uh, for, for various uh, problems in, in robotics. Uh, so I'll give you kind of a quick sketch and overview of conformal prediction, just so you have the, the main uh, kind of intuition and the main results. Uh, so you can think of conformal prediction as a procedure that takes as input uh, some pre-trained model. Uh, and the pre-trained model outputs some confidence scores on k classes uh, given some input. So you can think of x as an image, and maybe these are object categories. And so you have confidences, just softmax scores on the object categories. Uh, and we're also going to assume that we have some calibration data set, um, xi, yi, x is some input, y is the label. Um, and just to kind of emphasize two points here, this f hat uh, that's scoring uh, the different options, like these confidences can, can be heuristic. They're not necessarily calibrated in any way. Uh, and this distribution that the examples are drawn from uh, is not known explicitly known to us. Uh, so conformal prediction takes this as input and produces a new model uh, that outputs prediction sets. So instead of just outputting a single label, uh, for every input, we're going to output a, a set of labels. Um, and so in the image classification setting, um, so given an image, we're going to output some set of possible objects that are in the, the image. Uh, and the guarantee that's going to come from conformal prediction uh, is that with some user-defined probability, uh, 1 minus epsilon, uh, new examples um, that you get uh, that are, were not in your calibration data set, uh, these prediction sets are going to contain uh, the true label uh, for those new examples, uh, or a true label uh, if you have kind of multiple uh, possible acceptable uh, labels. So that's the, the kind of guarantee that conformal prediction gives you. And just kind of to be explicit, in, in our context, the labels are A, B, C, D, E corresponding to the different plans, uh, and conformal prediction is going to generate some subset. Uh, Abhishek. On what test distribution? Yes, so the test distribution is the same uh, as the distribution from which your calibration data uh, were generated. Yeah. yeah, so there's no distribution shift here. So it's just generalizing to new inputs. It's different from the heuristic, and the thing that is used to get the heuristic. Yes, analysis. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. And, and just to make sure, yes. in your case, the LLM produces both the possible next steps and the ranking. Yes, for yes, and, and we do this in a okay. yeah, and we do this in a kind of two-step process. So we first generate the possible next steps, and then we kind of re-query, reprompt the model to generate the, the confidences. Yep. Okay, good. Um, so I'll describe kind of how this works uh, in the single time step setting. So by single time step, I mean where the robot plans only once. Um, so this is not a receding horizon setting. The robot just comes up with some sequence of actions and just kind of executes that. I'll yeah, say a little bit more about the multi-step setting in a, in a bit. Uh, so in this setting, what we do is we collect uh, pairs of contexts and labels. Uh, context, again, was the original instruction, the description of the environment, and the plans, the different plans that are generated. Uh, and the label here is uh, some correct plan. Uh, for now, I'm going to, uh, I guess, ignore the point that Sid made. I'm going to assume that there's some unique correct plan, uh, but we can kind of generalize the, the framework to cases where you have multiple acceptable plans. Uh, so the way conformal prediction works is actually quite straightforward. Uh, what we do is for each example in our calibration data, we define these non-conformity scores, which is 1 minus the confidence uh, that is assigned to the true label. So this non-conformity score is really high 
when your model is very bad. So if the model is assigning high confidence uh, to something that's wrong, uh, or sorry, low confidence to, to something that's correct, uh, then this nonconformity score is, is high. Um, you then uh, construct an empirical histogram uh, of these nonconformity scores, uh, and you define q hat to be roughly the 1 minus epsilon empirical quantile of these nonconformity scores. There's some small correction term, but it's kind of roughly 1 minus epsilon um, uh, yeah, quantile. So that's, that's all at the calibration step. Uh, then at test time, you're given some new input. Um, so in this case, some new instructions, some new environment. You generate some new plans. Uh, what we do is we uh, generate a prediction set uh, by just including all the options that are scored higher than 1 minus q hat, where q hat was the threshold that was computed uh, from your calibration uh, data. Um, so in this example here, so we have these five plans. We score them using the softmax scores. Uh, our threshold, 1 minus q hat, happens to be 0.32 uh, for these examples. Uh, so we just include option B. That's the only option uh, that has a score that's higher than, uh, than 0.32. So that's our prediction set. So if this set is a singleton, so if it contains only one option, then the robot executes that plan. Uh, and as I mentioned, if this uh, uh, set is a non-singleton, so if it contains multiple options, then that triggers a call for help. Uh, the robot clarifies with the human kind of which, which plan should it actually execute. Uh, and we're assuming here that the human is kind of always correct, that it chooses the correct plan if it's in the prediction set. Uh, or if it's not in the prediction set, then the human just kind of halts the, the operation. OK, so conformal prediction uh, has two nice uh, theoretical properties. Uh, the first is the one I mentioned before. So on new examples, uh, kind of beyond your calibration data set, uh, you can guarantee with some user-defined probability uh, that the prediction set will contain uh, the true label on those new examples. Uh, but of course, you can do that in a kind of simple way. Like if your prediction set is the entire set of labels, uh, then you can always guarantee coverage, so it's not super useful. You also want the sets to have small size. Uh, so that's the other thing that CP tries to do, is tries to minimize the average size of the, the prediction sets uh, as well. Uh, and these two properties kind of naturally correspond to the two uh, things that I had uh, described previously. Um, so coverage gives you uh, calibrated confidence. So we can define some user, user uh, defined uh, threshold of, of success, uh, 1 minus epsilon. Uh, and we can guarantee that the plans that the robot comes up with, uh, like the prediction set, uh, is going to contain at least one correct plan with this user defined. Uh, probability of success. And if we assume that the human is perfect, uh, then that translates to a, a kind of end-to-end -end task uh, completion guarantee. Uh, and the second uh, property that conformal prediction kind of minimizes the average prediction set uh, addresses our goal of minimal help. So the robot is trying to minimize the average number of options that are presented to the human uh, to disambiguate uh, between. OK. So there are a couple of extensions to, to this kind of basic setup. Um, so the first, as I mentioned, is when you don't just have one uniquely correct plan that's generated. If you have multiple plans that are maybe semantically uh, similar or semantically identical, um, or just kind of multiple plans that are different, but all of, or, or many of them are, are acceptable, uh, you can also extend uh, our, setting, our framework to, to that setting. Uh, there, the guarantee is basically that your prediction set is going to contain at least one acceptable plan. Uh, the more technically kind of involved extension is in the multi-time step setting, where the robot plans multiple times. So it comes up with a plan, uh, it executes something, uh, maybe it clarifies uh, something with the human, and then it replans, and so on. Um, and that can potentially lead to some distribution shift that you need to be careful about. Uh, but we have an extension of conformal prediction that, that addresses that. Uh, setting uh, as well. I'm happy to kind of describe the details of that if people are interested. OK, so that's the basic kind of technical approach. So maybe let me pause again and see if there are uh, questions on the, the algorithms or the results. Go ahead. Yeah, just a quick thing about the uh, multi-step conformal yes. question. Do you mean it's like for a multi-step plan, you think of like multiple options for each step and ask the human? Or like you try to think of an entire trajectory first? Yeah. And then clarify the first step and then 
do it in like the receding horizon manner? Yeah, so it's receding horizon. So initially, you come up with uh, like sequences of, of plans. Um, but yeah, I guess the clarification is just asking the human at this time step, uh, is this something I should do, or, or is this uh, something like, or should I do something else? Uh, but the planning happens in a receding horizon fashion. Yeah. Good, go ahead. So a clarifying <coughs> question. I know you said this, but the scores, the softback scores, are you getting those just for prompting or? Yes, so those are just kind of the raw softmax scores. Uh, potentially you could do some fine tuning as well. Uh, the way that I guess impacts results is your coverage guarantee is always valid. So no matter how kind of bad your softmax scores are, you'll always have this guarantee from conformal predictions, which is that uh, your prediction sets at test time will, with high probability, contain uh, a correct option. Uh, but if your underlying softmax scores are bad, then the prediction sets you generate might be large. Uh, so that, that's kind of unhelpful, yeah. You're literally only learning the, the threshold. Yes. Or estimate, you're not learning. Yeah, your yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's super simple. Uh, really bad language model, yeah. the threshold might be zero, which means exactly. we accept everything you say because yeah. there's just no preference. Basically. Exactly. So it'll always kind of clarify. It'll always ask for help. Yeah. So there are more kind of sophisticated versions where you can learn or estimate like more parameters. So if you have like a temperature parameter, for instance, in your um, yeah, softmax uh, score, or if you have other parameters, you can learn those. I guess another approach is if you have some amount of data that you fine tune your model with. Uh, you do that fine tuning first, and then you apply this as a kind of additional layer that does the uncertainty quantification. Yep. Good. Yeah, question. Is there a reason you decided to go with more options rather than like more or less? Uh, it was sort of a silly reason, which is that the OpenAI API, I think at the time, we could only get uh, five uh, <laughs> uh, softmax scores. Yeah, so it was not, not, not good reasons. Yeah. So the, the Q hat threshold that you have, it's a data point agnostic, right? Like it's Yes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So like there are certain things you might be more certain about or less certain about. Does that like does that already get reflected? Because it seems weird to be like totally X agnostic, the threshold. Yeah, I guess the X part is uh, like should be coming in with the softmax scores, right? So the softmax scores should be sensitive to the input. Yeah. I see it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Yes, let me describe some results next. So we evaluated this approach on a, uh, on a few different platforms in simulation and on hardware uh, as well. Um, hey, so robots. Oops, sorry, let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to first uh, present just some qualitative results uh, and then some numerical uh, results and comparisons as well. Uh, so just the first example is going to be this mobile manipulation uh, example that I've kind of been using as a running example. Hey, robot. Could you put the bowl on a small counter in the microwave? Should I pick up the metal bowl or the plastic bowl? Pick up the plastic bowl, please. Yeah, and these are also sped up, so I think this is 4x. Uh, speeding up this going back to the question. Uh, I guess in this example, um, there's no ambiguity. So there are two different kinds of chips. So I think it's kettle chips and rice chips. Um, so put the kettle chips in the landfill. Uh, robot kind of picks it up, puts it in the landfill. So the threshold kind of combines mistakes made based on the vision model and mistakes based on the LLM kind of reasoning, right? Um, okay, so here the we're kind of assuming that we're ignoring the the vision uh, the VLM part. Uh, there could be mistakes there as well, uh, and yeah, I guess those mistakes could also be baked into the the conformal prediction procedure. Yeah. Uh, this is an interesting example. So the, the prompt here is, does the kettle chips in Red Bull, I ate it already, can you dispose of it? Um, so this is an example of a Winograd uh, schema. So the, the word it is potentially ambiguous, and you need to do some common sense reasoning. You need to reason that you can eat kettle chips, you cannot eat Red Bull. Uh, and so it must be referring to, to kettle chips. Uh, I guess LLMs kind of, yeah, 
a couple of years ago were, were not able to, to do this, but nowadays uh, they are, and so there's actually no ambiguity here, uh, and the robot just executes the, the single kind of plan that was uh, selected. Um, we have some other kind of embodiments as well. So this is a bimanual manipulation setup um, uh, where there's ambiguity in terms of which, which objects should be picked up, which bin uh, they should be placed in, uh, and I think which arm uh, should, be, should be used as well. Uh, and the next one is a tabletop rearrangement uh, setup where we're simulating a human that has some preferences for kind of healthier kinds of food. Uh, these preferences are only partially uh, revealed to the, the planner. Uh, and the robot's job is then to sort new items of food based on whether or not uh, it thinks the human likes them. And then if it's not kind of sure or not confident, uh, then it clarifies with the human, like, do you like this or not? Uh, question. So the viewpoints that you use always these, like, sort of top-down facing the robot viewpoints? Or, like, do you use information from a camera on a gripper or? Uh, yeah, so let me see. So I think for, for this setup, there's, uh, like, RGBD cameras. Uh, yeah, just kind of, um, yeah, in, in the workspace. Uh, I don't remember whether this was multi-view or, or not. Uh, because like that'll change the way spatial references look, depending on perspectives or depending on whether something's close to something or not. That's correct. Yeah. So there could be ambiguity there, right? And actually, uh, I'll describe like a simulation example where where there is ambiguity uh, that that's like spatial in in nature. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I guess those are some qualitative results. So we've also done a number of comparisons with uh, with baselines. Um, so maybe one of the simple kind of baselines is what we call simple set, where you again generate a prediction set, uh, but you just trust the softmax scores that come from the model. Uh, so you rank the options with your f hat, and you construct a prediction set such that the cumulative score equals one minus epsilon. So here we're not doing any conformal prediction; we're just kind of treating the the raw softmax scores as calibrated. Uh, there's ensemble set where you do the same thing, uh, but you use the empirical frequency with a randomized prompt. So this is an ensembling-based method that's quite popular in uncertainty quantification, like Bayesian uncertainty quantification. There are some prompting-based baselines as well, prompt set, where you just ask the LLM directly to generate some prediction set. Uh, binary set, where you uh, ask the LLM to generate some uh, binary kind of notion of, of certainty. Uh, and then maybe the simplest uh, baseline, no help, where the LLM just executes the, the plan with the highest uh, confidence. Yeah, and I guess these examples that I'll show were with uh, the Palm 2L uh, language model. Um, so here are some simulation ex uh, experiments. Um, so here the setup is there's a bunch of balls and, and blocks of different colors, and the task is to move a certain number of objects to a specified location. Uh, there are different kinds of ambiguity here. So there's ambiguity in terms of how you refer to the, the objects. If you say receptacle, instead of ball, or you kind of use weird words for, for things. Um, there's some numerical ambiguities where you say move a few blocks, but you don't specify exactly how many. Uh, and there's some spatial ambiguities if you say move something next to, but you don't specify kind of exactly where you want it, but where the user does care about the exact uh, spatial location. Um, so the first thing that we see is with conformal prediction, we're able to get to the desired level of success uh, consistently uh, with, yeah, with uh, orange, which is the, the conformal prediction-based approach. I guess in some sense, this is not surprising. This is exactly what conformal prediction is giving you. It's giving you the ability to control the error rate, uh, the probability that uh, like your prediction set contains the, the true plan or the correct plan. Uh, what's maybe slightly more interesting is if you look at uh, the task success rate uh, on the y-axis and the prediction set size on the x-axis, uh, what we find is with conformal prediction, uh, we're able to get to higher levels of success uh, with a lower average prediction set uh, size. Uh, and you see something similar if you look at the human help rate, so the probability that the human is queried for help instead of the average prediction set size. And again, the y-axis is the task success rate. We see something similar where you can get to uh, higher levels of success with less help uh, from the human. So, uh, I guess conformal prediction is kind of giving you two things. One is this nice statistical guarantee that your prediction sets will contain uh, a correct plan or an acceptable plan with the user-defined probability. Uh, but you also see some empirical benefits where you can get to a desired level of success 
uh, with less help if you use this control model prediction based uh, recipe. So, um, is there a way to compute the complexity of a query? So you talked about different kinds of ambiguity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's a great question. We thought about it a bit. Uh, we were trying to come up with some kind of information theoretic uh, quantities uh, that like quantify how ambiguous a distribution of scenarios is. I don't think we came up with something we were totally satisfied with. But yeah, I guess that, that might be an interesting question too. But I guess like conditioned on whatever scenarios you chose, these results are what you see. Like so, but yeah, I am yeah. curious about that. Yeah, I don't think we had a good quantitative measure. Did that... you have an intuition of it? Like... Yeah, I think we did. Let me, let me see. So we were thinking about the, um, so maybe the, the kind of like mutual information between the prompt that's given to the robot and the, the actual uh, like goal uh, or like user preference, uh, something like that. Um, so yeah, basically, if that quantity is low, then that's a highly ambiguous situation because the prompt is not specifying enough information to clarify the human's actual preferences. But I think kind of working out the, the details of that, we didn't end up doing. Yeah. On a related note, uh, how did you ask the clarifying question? So you had the, the set and then you distilled it into a question. Like how do you get that? Yeah, so there are two ways. I think the most kind of theoretically grounded way is you just present the prediction set to the human and you ask the human to, to pick. Uh, what I was showing in these examples is we ask a language model to generate a question uh, such that the ans answer is likely to disambiguate between the options. Yeah. And that works pretty well. That works pretty well, yeah. Yeah, there's not like that many options, so, so that, I think that makes it easier. Yeah. Cool. Um, Dear. What kind of threshold did you uh, set for the probabilities? Right, um, so this one, uh, this mobile manipulator one, uh, I think we set, yeah, this one we set it at uh, 0.85, 85% success rate. Um, yeah, it's roughly 85 to 90% or so, that was the, the threshold, yeah, for success. Yeah. Interesting, so, so given, for example, the, you could, the, given the capabilities of the current model set, yeah. especially if you would fold in additional noise from the VLMs, yeah. you would say, I actually want my robot to succeed at least 99% of yes. the time, yeah. then I guess it's fair to say still that uh, given these current models, yeah. you virtually always have to involve Exactly. Them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not there yet, I think. There's still <laughs> a long way to go. So even with 85%, you see like pretty high help rates. I mean, of course, these examples were constructed to be ambiguous, to kind of make this interesting. So you can generate examples where there's not that much ambiguity. Um, so it is kind of scenario dependent, and this goes back to Sid's question of how ambiguous are the distribution of uh, other scenarios that you're deploying. But at least for these, yeah, it was like pretty, uh, like to, to get to even these levels of success, you had to kind of query the human quite a bit. Yeah. Just another related yeah. question. So, so the LMs, they might be good at certain kinds of questions yeah. and really bad at other kinds of questions, yes. right? Yeah. Could you imagine? grouping those somehow and yeah. do thresholds based on those. That would be like super that. interesting, yes. If you could have some kind of uh, like latent variable that you're yeah. uh, identifying, and then you have a threshold based on that. Uh, there are, like I mentioned, some more like sophisticated versions of conformal prediction, like recent versions that kind of allow you more flexibility. Uh, and we're exploring some of those. Uh, we didn't do it here, but that would be awesome. Yeah. 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 Um, do you know in how many of these scenarios even an expert human would have required help? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know the number specifically, uh, but we were kind of constructing these in a way that, uh, that there was a fair bit of ambiguity. Uh, but I don't so think like it's... The 60s, so there's some baselining that we need to do with the... Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, right, 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 right. Okay. Yeah. 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 So do you think it's close to this or not? Like, because that would be a valuable number to yes. know. Also. Yeah, I, I should I should double check. I, I don't know the answer. Yeah, um, I would expect that it's it's not this high. Like maybe it's 30, 40 percent or something like that, just based on kind of intuition for what these examples look like. But yeah, I should have the exact number. Yeah. I suppose there's another type of error too, which is you could not ask for help, do something, and you did the wrong thing. Yeah. Whereas if you had asked for help, you would have done the right thing, and a person could make that mistake. Sure. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. I guess when you were running these experiments. Was it always the same, or roughly like the same small population of people asking the questions, or did it yes. constantly vary? Yeah, we we just kind of yeah generated some kind of distribution of questions, but but that's another interesting. I would just uh, expect that like 
eventually if you interact with a robot a lot yeah. and you keep seeing uh, it's, it doesn't understand when I speak this way but yes. generally my, when my language is less ambiguous yeah. it doesn't need to ask for help as much yep. you'll be sort of rewarded as the user to use the less ambiguous language yes. you'll yeah. get trained on it yeah that's true yeah 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 that that's not something we did here but would be would be cool to do here yeah. Um, maybe just one more point on, on something that Dieter mentioned here. Uh, so we also tried changing the language model. So uh, these experiments were with a non-instruction fine-tuned version of Palm 2L. Um, yeah, if we use an instruction fine-tuned version of Palm 2L, the results are kind of similar. There's a slight benefit in terms of the average prediction set sizes that are generated. Uh, but if you use an older model, so GPT 3.5, um, yeah, you see that to get to the same level of success, you actually need to ask for much more help, like 86% uh, in this case. Uh, so I, I guess this is a, a kind of nice feature in a way of conformal prediction, which is that you're, you can specify some level of success. Conformal prediction will figure out what the threshold is to get you to that level of success, like how much help to ask for to get to that level of success. Uh, but if you kind of improve your underlying foundation model, you make it better and better. Uh, then, yeah, you're going to ask for kind of less and less help. So there's this kind of nice, uh, yeah, like growth uh, with the, the power of your underlying model, which I think is a good feature. Yeah. I have a question. So there's the model that's creating like the multiple choices, and there's the model that is deciding which choice. Yeah. In this case, are you using the same model for yes. both? Yes, 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 okay. yeah. Yeah, you could use different models, but yeah, we're using the same one. Yeah, I, I guess it would be interesting to see if you kept the um, multiple choice model the same and yeah. then tried different models for selecting. Yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, I think maybe I want to leave some time for more questions. Uh, we have a few kind of directions for future works, so incorporating so I guess Dieter mentioned uh, perception errors, but there's also errors in the low-level action policy. Uh, so incorporating errors in that, that's not something we did in this work, but I think we have potential ways of baking that into the conformal prediction pipeline as well. Uh, active preference learning, so I guess that relates to the previous question. Like if you're interacting with the same human, like ideally you want the human and the robot to kind of adapt to each other and figure out like what's important in terms of clarifying things or, or not. Uh, and I think more broadly, just doing rigorous uncertainty quantification for other foundation models, uh, multimodal models for perception, uh, I think a similar recipe could potentially extend to, to, to broader uh, settings as well. Uh, so yeah, I guess just to conclude, I've, I've presented this framework that uh, does rigorous uncertainty quantification using conformal prediction uh, in a way that provides calibrated confidence, uh, minimal help. Uh, and as I mentioned, we we're kind of thinking about how we can uh, extend these techniques to uh, do rigorous uncertainty quantification for other uh, uh, foundation models. Uh, so yeah, I guess hopefully I've kind of convinced you that this is some interesting uh, 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 steps towards rigorous uncertainty quantification for language models uh, and, and beyond. Um, so this work was led by my PhD student, uh, Alan Wren. A uh, couple of other postdocs and students from my group, and a number of uh, collaborators uh, from Google uh, DeepMind. Uh, this is our group currently. So we have eight PhD students, one postdoc. We're, I guess, always looking for people. So if you're interested in postdoc positions or, or, or other collaborations, uh, feel free to, to reach out. Uh, and we have a bunch of our code uh, kind of freely available. So if you want to play around with some of this uh, or are interested in learning more about conformal prediction, feel free to check out our website. Uh, and yeah, I think that's all I had, so I'll stop here and take any further questions. Time for a few questions. Yeah. Or is there someone? Just to student first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, there have been like a lot of papers on like uh, like chain of thoughts or like React or like yes. all kind of like self prompts and kind of like does more inference on its own. Yep. Um, could you see that helping, like, reduce even further the amount of help that? Yeah, that's a great, great question. So I guess there's chain of thought, there's React, there's like trees of thought as well that does some like research. Uh, like all of those, you could kind of do before you prompt the or re-prompt the LLM to generate the confidence scores. Uh, so when you're generating the different plans, you could kind of use whatever prompting uh, techniques you have. And then once you've gone through that process, then you can ask the model to 
score them, and that could potentially help. We didn't do it here, but but uh, or we might have done chain of thought for some of these, but uh, but we didn't do like React or trees of thought here. Um, how large does your does this data set have to be to do the calibration? Yeah, so with these examples, they were uh, about like 500 examples. Um, so uh, 500. So an example is uh, like the instruction, the plans, and the, the labels. So it's not gigantic, I would say. So kind of relatively modest. I guess whatever 500, uh, whether that's smaller or not. Yeah. I mean. And someone you could also use these, of course, for fine tuning of your model itself. Yes. Of course, then your confounded these scores won't be right anymore because you're overfitting to them. Yeah, but, potentially. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. still, it might be interesting to see if using those for that purpose as well. Yeah, I think we had started to play around with it, uh, but didn't see that much benefit with the fine tuning. But I think it might just be that you need a slightly larger data set to do the fine tuning, uh, and then you have to do conformal prediction kind of separately with a different data set. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Good, thank you.